How would you describe Arthur's temperament? Arthur's uh, was he um, somebody who um, was um, did um, did he have much of a sense of humor? I, I have, I've heard that he was a bit humorless. I don't know if that's true. I don't know a lot about it. I, when I was doing some work on it a while, many years ago, when I was a student at the university, I. I, uh, of course, inevitably planned to write the great American novel, and the title of it was, of all things, Alki. Uh, and I did some considerable research at the time, talking to some of the people that were still around. And the one, it, I, the word that comes uh, through to me is ascetic. Uh, you know that he uh, he he was a very uh, that Arthur Denny Arthur Denny comes through. What little I've been able to find out of a personal sort. Of course, he wrote quite a bit, and you can tell a lot from what people write about their personalities and attitudes and so on. He was a teetotaler. Remember that in his first session of the territorial legislature of the state of Washington, he introduced three very important bills. One was for the establishment of the University of Washington, one was for the abolition of uh, the sale consumption or manufacture of uh, alcoholic beverages, and the third uh, was for women's suffrage. And uh, uh, only the first of those three passed, but uh, he was very much a liberal in the old Republican sense, uh, a sense not understood really in the present time which we live, but he was very much a liberal in that old sense. And uh, he was an abolitionist, and of, I mean, I'm talking about slavery, and he was... Uh, uh, very much on all of the right sides of all of the big social issues. But he was, I think recluse may be too strong a word, but one of the best stories that one of his granddaughters told me about him was that he apparently carried in his pocket a, uh, a sewing kit in the, in the well, event. I heard you, hit, you just kind of bumped your mic. So yeah, because I was pointing to my yeah, pocket. That's fine. Yeah, that's right. Go, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Point uh, to your one, pocket again. But, but one of the great stories about Arthur Denny that I picked up from one of his granddaughters, I can't remember which, probably Sophie, was that he carried a sewing kit in his pocket, thinking that he might, you know, a button might come off and he'd have to fix it. You know, and I, I, that has always struck me as really a wonderful thing. Uh, I was also told that he did not regularly eat meals with his family in later life. Uh, now, maybe this is all, of course, memories of the last 10 years or something of that sort, but he was very active in the community up to close to his death. So, but he, he, uh, he, and he, was, and he, he was awfully busy. He worked all the time in, at, at the various things that he was trying to do for his community. So I've, he, he, may, uh, he may have been a, a fairly... Uh, I think ascetic is kind of a good word. Starting with Ada, would you give, say hello, I am, in your full name? Uh, my name is Ada Woodhouse Hallberg. I have no middle name. Mother didn't give either of her daughters middle names because she thought they were unnecessary. And uh, I was born in Seattle in August 1924 in Swedish Hospital. And uh, then I came home from Swedish Hospital to uh, a house that my grandfather Bowden had built, and that was at 2613 Marine Avenue Southwest. Marine Avenue is a little street. It has uh, just one block on each side of it, and it is between 58th and 59th off of Alki Avenue. I have to explain that so you don't think I live on Marine View Drive Southwest, which is not where I live. But uh, I had a, do, would you like me to continue to tell you about my family? Because I have a, an older brother, five years older, and a sister five years younger. And we all lived together with my grandmother, Grandma Bowden, whose name was Ada Bowden, and she was my mother's uh, mother. She had, uh, she and her husband were uh, pioneers and they were married in uh, Tacoma about 1889, and my mother was born in Seattle in 1891. They didn't stay here uh, for a long time, 
at that point because when their daughter was about four or five, they went back east to raise her in Cleveland, Ohio. And then uh, they returned to Seattle, and my mother was married here to my father, John Woodhouse. John Woodhouse uh, was a pioneer also. My name is Bob Hallberg, and uh, I'm actually Robert M. Hallberg III. <laughs> but my uh, daddy and mother uh, came here in uh, different fashion after the First World War. My father uh, got a job with the Milwaukee Railroad, and he worked for, uh, he was a secretary for a vice president of the road that was um, always, uh, or most of the year, on the road. He was in, in charge of uh, track maintenance and, and bridges, tunnels, all the, the line. And whenever there was an accident or a disaster on the railroad, uh, this vice president was, uh, would usually go right to the scene and then he'd start the repairs and and my dad uh, would take the photographs and record all the um, details of the accident and at, apparently at some time they were on the division uh, in Montana the, the division headquarters were in Deer Lodge and my daddy uh, met my mother there and she was the daughter of the roadmaster of the Milwaukee for that division. So the two of them became enamored of one another. And uh, my grandpa, uh, Nick, who was the roadmaster, was transferred to Tacoma. And my, my father, his job wouldn't let him see uh, or didn't allow him to see uh, my mother very frequently. Uh, his hard interest at the time. So um, he left the railroad and got a job with a bank in Tacoma so that he could continue the courtship. And they were married in Tacoma, and I was born shortly after. But, the, oh, i got to ask you, say one thing. There were some pools here, but um, I don't know if you want me to, I don't think I should talk anymore. I think you should talk. But I, uh, the question about why did we swim in the sound, I will say one thing. When the Alki Natatorium came in 1930, uh, what year I've forgotten, 32 or 3 or 4 or 5, when it was built, it was built on the beach, on pilings, taking the area of the beach right up to the street and then out over the water. It, was, it took the area from 59th to Marine Avenue, and that meant that was no longer available for you to swim on the beach. It was no longer there. The sand was no longer in that area. There was this wonderful pool, which I think most people in West Seattle loved. But uh, that was uh, never the real alki that those of us of the 30s and 20s remember because we had just what I described in Bob. And Luna, there was a Luna pool, which went in much earlier. There was also... Um I think that it was taken out in about 1930, 31. But there were two or three little pools. They were uh, more than 15, 20 feet wide and maybe 30 feet long, <coughs> way down at the end of the promenade. You don't remember them, but I can remember when there was water in them. And uh, the, the ferry was there. They must have been beyond the ferry. No, no, they were this side of the ferry dock. Huh. Just almost at the end of the promenade, and they um, they were uh, filled with, at a very very high tide. They fill them well, and if you didn't get high tides for a couple of weeks, the water um, became very warm. But it probably was uh, the bacteria count must have been in the millions, <laughs> 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 and. Uh, and they, were, they just had sand bottoms. They were, um, if I remember correctly, probably uh, creosoted pilings or creosoted timbers um, f 
for sides, no bottom, just sand, and it was, uh, um, well, it was, uh, when, the, when they brought the new water in, a lot of seaweed came with it, because the seaweed always floated on top, and that's where they would draw the water from. So it wasn't a really neat place to swim, because you had to kind of push all of this seaweed out of the way, and you knew or your mother had warned you that you shouldn't swim in there because some of those boys probably went to the bathroom, right? <laughs> probably. <laughs> <laughs> well, my mother Was never let me go down to... <laughs> <laughs> she wasn't very comfortable with any of the pools, and this, especially during the 30s when we had these um, outbreaks of infantile paralysis, and there was a... Um, general feeling that that uh, some people had contracted this disease well, Carol, swimming in public pools. Uh, Carol's mother felt she had gotten polio from there, from the natatorium. Oh. Yeah. So at any rate, my, my mother was delighted to have me swim in the sewerage out in the bay. I know, that <laughs> is the funny thing, and maybe we should talk a minute about that. Oh, it was terrible. The because sewer outfalls were... Uh, just oh. a few hundred yards offshore, and all of this human waste would come floating back in certain tides and certain uh, uh, currents. And uh, no, we just stayed out of the water. That was hours, and then pretty soon the tide had changed, and you'd have some fresh water. And Except it wasn't quite I so never bad. knew that. I didn't know until I was grown up and married that that had been sewage all in it. I don't know, when Metro began to clean up the sound, I thought, why are they cleaning up the sound? Because my mother, she didn't understand that either. She, she did not know that that was all sewage in there. She would say whenever I had a cut or anything, and you could get cut on the beach with glass very often, go in the bay and wash it off, you know, and soak your foot <laughs> in that nice cold salt water. <laughs> now, I know she could not possibly have known but I'm just astounded at things my mother didn't know after I grew up. <clears throat> One of the things I was very much involved in was the open housing. Open housing was a very, uh, very tough issue that people of Seattle had to deal with, whether or not we were going to be able to discriminate against people on the basis of of uh, ca color, creed, or national origin, and so on. And so I was. It was being. It was very interesting being a real estate broker, while being at the f right at the front of the civil rights uh, movement that w took place during the 1960s, especially because the real estate board of which I was a member was the primary organization against it. <laughs> so it resulted in some very, very interesting times. Part of the things that I had, I went back to Washington, D.C. to see Congress uh, speak before congressional committees about, about this subject. And um, I got to know Senator Jackson as a result, who was very strongly entrenched in in Washington D.C. and eventually became a runner for the president of the United States. And so I would think that he was uh, responsible for me getting this telegram from Lyndon B. Johnson, who had become president upon the assassination of President Kennedy. So on August 10th of 1964, I received this as follows. I would be pleased if you could join me for a reception at the White House 4.30 p.m. on August 20th and exchange a views with you and other outstanding leaders of our country is, I believe, important and desirable. I would be grateful if you would wear me that you can be present. Please, please present this telegram at Southeast Gate, Lyndon E. Johnson, B. Johnson. So I, I didn't know much about what it was all about, but I, did, I went back to Washington in response to this. 
what this was, he was trying to calm the country down after Kennedy's shocking demise. And he had different groups coming into his, to the White House to uh, let them know what the state of the country was in various areas. And so this East Room we went to, all met in, was just full of so-called small businessmen. And it was quite an experience to be there at the White House and greet the president per personally and hear all the top people in the cabinet telling about where we stood militarily, economically, et cetera, et cetera. So that was an interesting experience that stemmed out of my activities.